I was uh, in China for the first time in 1986, and we've just heard about the growth rate in the last 10 years of being about 10.3 percent. It's my pleasure to introduce to you our last speaker, who is Professor Chan Chi Wu. Um, he is from the Peking University Guanghua Business School, which is one of the top, very top business schools in China. It is also AACSB accredited, and that is quite an accomplishment, as many business schools in the United States cannot meet those requirements. Um, he is the associate dean there. He is also professor and chair of the Department of Strategic Management. He is also head of the MBA executive, the executive MBA program. So I think he's running almost all of the school at this point. We're lucky that he had time to come here to see us. Um, Formerly, he was on the faculty of the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. He received his bachelor's degree in economics from the Shandun University and his MBA with distinction and his doctorate in applied economic sciences from the Catholic University of Louvain in Belgium. His primary interests are in multinational enterprises and also in incentives in international joint ventures and dynamics of market cooperation. He is sitting on boards of listed companies in China as an independent director. One of these is the largest machinery producer in China. And he is also a member of the Strategic Planning Committee of China. It is my pleasure to introduce my friend, Professor Wu. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished executive guests, MBA students, it's a great honor uh, to be here to talk with a group of people. And uh, as the previous uh, speaker has made it clear that BRIC, emerging markets, are moving fast. Okay. But now I'm going to talk about the largest emerging market in the world, that is China. Okay. China has been praised for remarkable economic achievement in the last quarter of a century. And such also the economic growth in China not only changed the life of Chinese people, but it also provides opportunities for companies like Cunnings, like Ili Lili. On the other hand, China also been blamed for many illnesses in the global economy, such as rising energy prices, rising commodity prices, and the imbalance of global trade and finance. So now we are talking about China. Actually, that's a contradictory and a per periodical uh, phenomenon. Actually, I reflected in newspaper headlines and uh, some of the business books title of some business books. Right? You can see some, some uh, book titles uh, coming collapse of China. Some of you probably, particularly live in Hong Kong, you notice that. And others say that uh, does China matter? On the other hand, you can see the book title like China Century, China Price, the China and other things. So what my talk today is to try to demystify some of the hypes and to have a reality check of what has happened in China. But I'm going to talk in this very short period, because the last speaker always runs at risk. OK, oh, time's overrun. OK. <laughs> I, I, I have no risk, right? I already have time overrun. OK. okay. Actually, we're going to talk about three issues to understand and what has happened in China 
and what is going to happen in China, and can we take some opportunities and to be aware of some risks in the future development of China. Okay. Of course, uh, if you look at the China, now we better take uh, historical perspectives. Actually, indeed, in the last 250 years, China was viewed as a backward, decaying empire. Okay. Actually, in the last quarter century, in 25 years' time, China has changed has transformed itself. Okay, actually, indeed, from economic growth perspective, China's average annual growth of GDP and the GDP per capita in the last quarter century has maintained a 9%. Actually, that's highest and sustainable longest period of economic growth in mankind history. Okay. And the Chinese economy not only drive, not only grow fast, it's also it's one of the most open economy in the world. You've measured actually China's GDP and Chinese trade. Actually, China's GDP, actually 40% of China's GDP actually not, not be consumed by domestic economy, but actually exported. The so export to GDP ratio is about 40%. China also attract a lot of the multinational enterprises to that country. And in that regard, China also trade a lot and with the foreign reserve about 600 billion US dollars. Many of them are invested in treasury bonds and bills okay, in the US. Okay. But now, actually, this is all the hype, the good things about China. Okay. Indeed, you see, can China's GDP in the last year was uh, 13 billion, uh, 13 trillion RMB equivalent to 1.65 trillion US dollars. Okay, that amount, roughly equivalent to one seventh of that of the United States, but three times of that for Russia, and two and a half times. Uh, thanks for Mr. Brown. Know that but two and a half times of that was India. Okay. But you, you know that this is for any number come of China. It's gigantic. Okay. But one more thing that we, if we divided the GDP by its population, as we can see, China indeed is developing country. It's an emerging market, market economy. Okay. It's roughly about 1200 per capita GDP. Okay. Of course, why? And many people talk about China rising and China's century because, of, of course, World Bank using a so-called uh, purchasing power parity to adjust the relative prices of goods and services. Okay, in that, by that measure, uh, China's GDP per capita was roughly U.S. dollars 5,600. Okay, that being four times uh, the GDP measured at market exchange rate. Or market because Chinese currency is still uh, the pact to U.S. dollars, not free free flow um, uh, uh, exchange rate. Okay, so in this regard, in the purchasing parity uh, basis, China was considered a second largest economy. Okay, it's one measure. But the same institution, World Bank, also considered. You see, in this because we once we just by this principle, the purchasing power parity, we have to adjust all the countries. But after this adjustment, China still, on a per capita basis, is still ranked as 121, 121st, 21st uh, in the world based on the per capita, GDP per capita. Okay. But actually, think about the last quarter century. In 1979, China started the economic reform. At that time, actually, China faces two big challenges. One challenge is just many emerging market developing economy or de underdeveloped economy facing is transform itself towards industrialized economy from a developing economy. Okay. Second, uh, China also faces a task that's abandon the central planned economy, transform itself towards market oriented economy. That actually we benchmark when to measure China's economic performance and achievement we have to consider among, along these two dimensions.
But the, luckily, we have two countries that can be used to benchmarking China's economic progress. Okay. One is against the former Soviet Union, Russia. Okay. Because the second largest economy at that time that was considered one of the two superpowers. Okay. Second task is against India. Because China is the second largest developing economy. But if you look at China's economic progress on these two dimensions, here are the comparisons. This against China against Soviet Union. You see a pickup the USSR is 1985. Because in that, in that year, Mikhail Gorbachev started the Glasnost Perestroika. I said the economy reform and some uh, political reform. Okay? These are the comparisons. After those 20 years, Soviet Union has disintegrated. Okay? China's economy now is three times as large as then the, the one of the superpowers. Okay. This is a compare with India. Okay. I pick the particular year of 1990 because in that year China's GDP per capita was equivalent, identical to that of India. Okay. After 15 years, okay, that is a comparison along different dimensions, the political, economy, social, and other things. Uh, China's GDP per capita here, I mentioned about 50% higher than India. But actually, it seems close to uh, 90% uh, as, uh, with the uh, most recent data. Okay. So by these two account benchmarking, China indeed, its economy achievement, economy progress has been remarkable. Okay. Why is that? Two driving forces. One is China launched the economy reform led by a paramount leader Deng Xiaoping. Second, the Chinese economy from the very beginning in the reform period is open to foreign trade and foreign direct investment. So there's a number of critical factors that uh, lead to let me see, that uh, Chinese uh, economy uh, ach achievement. Okay. Now, first is China follow a way we call the gradualism. And China did not dismantle the state owned companies and the economies. Actually, China introduced the private economy actually to try to challenge the establishment of the state owned economy. Like the higher that companies had to acquire, put a bit against uh, Maytag, right? that higher itself is a non-state company. It's not a state company. It turned to be the largest domestic appliance producer in China. Okay. China tried to introduce competition, put pressure on state-owned enterprises. So let that them to reform. Also, uh, very important, a Chinese foreign direct investment that helped China to upgrade its technology to drive the economic growth. A moment ago, actually, we mentioned about uh, uh, there is the issue of the Chinese macro prudence, macroeconomic economic policy. You see, in the last 20 years, 25 years, and there are East Asia, the issue of financial crisis, the other things. But China's macroeconomic policy are more or less managed the economy to weather those hard times. By the way, I would mention that that's one of the graduates of Indiana University contribute to that. This is uh, the Secretary General of the People's Bank of China, uh, at the Central Bank of China, earned his PhD degree in economics from this very university. So thank you to the university. <laughs> <laughs> And, of course, there's a relative stable political environment because put aside the episode of 1989 Tiananmen Square um, event, in the last 20 years, by and large, the political environment 
is relatively stable. Okay. So that's why the Deng Xiaoping, you see, China considers the, the largest communist country in the world. But Chinese leader Deng Xiaoping said, regardless, right, whether it's black or white, the cat that catches the mouse is a good cat. Right? Very pragmatic. That, that essentially, as, a, as a, many of the executives had experience in China, typically the person starting negotiations sometimes as party secretary, right, talk about business instead of Karl Marx. Okay. But the issue here is with all these hypes, People ask, will China boom continue? Okay. When we talk about that, that is, without, that, is, that is not without precedent. Because in 1994, at that time, the East Asia Tigers, Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Thailand, Philippines, the other things, was considered East Asia miracle. At that time, people talk about East Asia miracle and ask many World Bank advocate that, ask many developing countries to follow that model. In that year, actually in 1994, actually in 1995, a scholar called Evan Young made a research, academic research. They challenged the World Bank report. Actually, his thesis was publicized by Paul Krugman. Yes, he's now regularly writes uh, columns in the New York Times. Right? Actually, what they talk about that, actually, the East measure, they talk about the myth of East Asia miracle. What is thesis was, actually, uh, East Asia miracle was largely based on the factor accumulation, what does it mean, the economic jar economics jargon. Actually, that is to put a lot of capital, borrow a lot of money, people moving to the countryside, the city. Actually, to measure those economies, not much productivity grows, not much efficiency gains, essentially. And also, a lot of foreign capital flew to that East Asian miracles. Uh, bank loans, not much technology embodiedness. So the tricky thing here, that when the myth of East Asian miracle was published in 1985, not a lot of people did not pay much attention to that. But the issue was, as we all know, right, as, uh, as Ms. Smith said here, and in 1997, East Asia, Asia financial crisis hit this region. Okay. So that America turned into mirage. It's turned a long time for those economies to recover. So sometimes, you see, academic research makes sense. But now, the issue here is will China story with replay of East Asia, East Asia miracle? Okay. Some say the Chinese economy, China's the peaked. It's peaking, right? But very early, this is same, Evan Young recently published another article. The title of this article is Gold into Base Metal a study a so-called China miracle. Okay, China was considered as, as, as a miracle, but actually, and then he decomposed some, many of those components. We say, well, fine, and Chinese economy is growing, has grown a lot, but it's not so dramatic. Its productivity growth and technology growth is roughly uh, 2%. It's not like a 7 or 9% of the economy and girls, but many other factors contribute to that, for instance, education, time, and other things. So the purpose, I think, would think about what are the fundamentals, right? As the economists who measure the economic growth along a number of dimensions, we consider the labor force and human capital, we consider the capital accumulation, whether China's savings and other capital, and technology upgrading, and with the government policies. These are the factors that make, that should make the economy on the sustainable growth track. As some of you uh, economics major or studied economics, we know that it is, it's what we call the growth model. Okay. Labor force. As many of this operating in China knows, indeed, China's infinite 
pool of low-wage labor. Okay. Of course, you see, that is uh, something some people operating in China consider, well, China's wage rate will go up because uh, there is shortage of labor, right? Actually, the 10 years ago, a Hong Kong government made a study. They consider, yes, indeed, in the coastal areas, the land price has gone up, the wage price has gone up. But actually, at that time, they advised some of the Hong Kong company needs to move to the inland. Right? But as a matter of fact, actually, the wage at, uh, I think, Pearl River Delta, in the Yangtze River Delta, maintained almost as 100 US dollar per month for the last 10 years. Because why? Because people moving from a hinterland in China towards the coast areas. Right? So a larger pool of low wage high school graduates, they're willing to sacrifice, they leave their homes and move into the coast cities looking for jobs. Okay. There also here, their labor force, there are, uh, whether there's a productivity increase introduced by many of the multinational companies and help to put the wage rate in check. Okay. On the other hand, okay, there's a human capital aside. Okay. Uh, just early this month, there are 8 million pupils sit for the college entrance exam. Okay. I think guess about more than half would get into the college. So in a matter of years, they would get out as engineers, and uh, as the economists and uh, business, bus and working in, in, in business. Okay. So to look at this, some uh, we talk about that also Im improved management training. I think indeed, as the early speaker uh, talk about, the China now also need to be managers and executives. Indeed, for ex for example, 2002, Ministry of Education suddenly allowed actually instructed 30 universities in China to open executive MBA program at the same time. You see, as, as one of the uh, director of executive program, think about how could this university find the professors to, to staff those executive MBA program. Okay. But of course, the returnees of overseas Chinese also, I think, fulfilling some of the posts for multinational enterprises and high rank officials, such as like the Bank of China, uh, uh, People's Bank of China, the Central Bank of China. Right? Actually, the governor is, uh, I think he studied at the Maryland University, right? the general secretary worked at the in Indiana University. So these people are now in the high rank positions and to run the country to make the economic policies. Okay. Uh, capital formation, okay, as mentioned by previous speakers, China has a saving rate uh, close to 40 percent, 38, 37 percent. Some believe China saved too much that creates the, the deficit, right, the trade deficit of the United States because save too much money. Okay. There are also two stock exchanges, uh, in, one in Shanghai and one in, in Shenzhen. Okay. That is, some uh, start to uh, allow some firms to uh, bypass uh, the, the state-owned banking systems to get directly a direct financing for that. But most fundamentally, the contribution to Chinese economic growth has been the remarkable foreign direct investment. Okay, this is that China was one of the largest recipients of FDI uh, in the world. Of course, it depends on the, on the different kind of the measure. I think the, that is a, uh, Luxembourg, if you look at World Investment Report, Luxembourg was ranked highest. Uh, last year, but the Luxembourg was uh, essentially a financial center, right? The money flowing in and and the math also uh, flown out. Okay. You see that China compared to early East Asian miracles, okay, and Chinese companies and Chinese economy as a whole actually benefit greatly from massive foreign direct investment, not bank loans, because that lead, of course that helped uh, foreign companies to tap a low-wage labor pool, but there's also the spillover effect to the Chinese economy in general, to Chinese firm in general. Of course, early years, uh, China uh, introduced a technology for market policy, encourage 
technology transfer. Right? That is, uh, uh, but one thing that also I would say lead to uh, rapid improvement of technology uh, status in China is actually many companies in the early years think about, wow, well, China is a developing country. Right? I just put a, a proper technology in China. But actually, because the Chinese economy is wide open, China turned to be a battlefield for large multinationals. Because if, let's say, if uh, General Motors uh, does not introduce the most new models to the market, Volkswagen will. So that they are competing using China as a battlefield to gain the consumer to penetrate the conquered market. So that leads to rapid technology upgrading and product level, at least in China. Okay. Of course, there are improved national innovation system and technology absorbing capability. Lately, we talk about other intellectual property issues. Right? This is an issue also for foreign multinationals and as for Chinese company as well. Okay. And the government policies here, okay, I think here in China is a very uh, peculiar situation. Okay. Actually, China gave favorable policies towards multinationals in order to attract the multinationals invest in China. Okay, for multinationals, typically there's a taxation, the income tax, the two years at income tax exemptions, starting from the year that company is making money. And three years, the in income tax is halved. Okay, so the halved. But now, you see that recently, they're trying to change that, trying to change it, to harmonize the income tax. So the domestic, firm, domestic firms and the fund multinationals will be treated equal, on the equal. That's actually their discussion. Uh, up to now, China does not have what is called competition policy. Competition policy it means the antitrust laws, and they are on the draft about 10 years. Up to now, it's not yet put in place. Why? Because you see, once this antitrust law and the competition policy is in place, the first target would be a state-owned enterprises. Right, these state-owned sectors. So state-owned companies are fighting to postpone that. But why do you want to raise that issue? Because many multinational firms, they are the leading uh, in the market share, number one and number two. So they are, there is a balance of uh, introduced competition law. Of course, industry policies, China has adopted certain policy encourage, encourage high-tech and other kind of industry develop, that is, uh, uh, high-tech zones, and uh, tomorrow we talk about the higher talk land prices, land prices, and that will help uh, attract certain companies uh, into China. Us that uh, Goldman Sachs paper talk about dreaming with bricks. Actually, there is a book. It's called China Dream. Some of you may not uh, have a take a look, but you look at it, China remain a dream, starting from a Marco Polo period, and the many people want to discover dig gold in China. But China is a difficult market. Okay? And China remain to many multinationals as is a still dream. Of course, uh, 1.3 billion people is considered a big market to sell to. I think uh, 20 years ago, um, Coca-Cola think about it, saying one person drink one can of Coca-Cola, that 1.3 billion can of Coca-Cola. Okay? But at that time, Chinese did not drink Coca-Cola. They drink tea, unfortunately, at that time. Okay. But now, yes, indeed, indeed, now about 10%, let's see, one, let's see 130, billion, 130 million uh, of people can regularly drink Coca-Cola. People estimate roughly about 10% of the population can buy a fast-moving consumer product like Coca-Cola. Okay. And there are challenges and pitfalls. Okay. You want to make China dream come true. Okay. But one thing, of a number of things, I, I, th I can see that my time is also, also limited. Uh, the one thing I want to, want to mention is actually that China is not a unified market. Okay. When the people are talking about the world is flat, China may not. <laughs> you see, 
This is the geography map of China. I can see that here along the coast area, that may be flat or flattening. But actually, the west regions, they are mountainous, not flat. What does that mean? What's the implication? Let me see. Okay. The implication here is that uh, China is divided. Divided by roughly, you, we have coastal area, central China, and western China. Okay. Each has own distinguishable economic characteristics and the political capital in regard. Now, if you talk about uh, doing business in China, it's very freeze, means something you have not yet been China, not yet in China. Because people, I think, parents talk about where in China. Whether it's the coastal area with Beijing, Shanghai, and Shenzhen, and the northeast, like the emperor has a factory there. Right? The different places would carry an enormous difference in, in some kind of cultural and the political and economic development. Okay. China is also divided by urban and rural areas. Okay. But more recently, because of economic reform, because of economic reform, the, the income differences also very big, with, even within the urban, urban area. That creates some kind of a problem. Okay. Why that? That is, uh, of course, there are a number of reasons. Okay. One of the reasons is once we, with China initially, a Chinese economy reform was not intended to privatize the, privatize the company. They tried to decentralize the company, decentralize the economy. That means, of course, they were not a central plant, but a provincial or uh, city uh, administration and government manages the company. The idea is to create a competition uh, between, among the provinces and hopefully to to improve economic efficiency. But that, at that time, it was fine. But lately, you see, the many provinces, if you could compete, you can't compete. Otherwise, you're trying to build up barriers across different regions. Okay. That is, uh, of course, that, uh, that is a uh, turn to be an uh, issue. The, one of the motives for, Chinese, for China to enter the WTO, World Trade Organization, it's not only to low, lower the barriers with other countries. One of the purposes is to lower the barriers within China, across different provinces. Okay. This is a market very fragmented. Of course, there are other uh, factors that also uh, influence that China's economic development is unemployment. unemployment. That is, uh, but you see, as we mentioned earlier, there's a division between urban population and uh, uh, rural population. Okay, the, the flow, the people are not, not freely moving from rural to the uh, urban area to looking for jobs. But of course, because the economy, the income difference is so large, so there are many people abandoning their hometown, abandoning their home, and looking for, moving to the city, looking for jobs. We talk about 100 million or more of floating population. This is, uh, I think, one they call homegrown illegal aliens. <laughs> right? Because they're moving from countryside, to, but actually they, they, they need work permit to work in the city. Okay? And sometimes they accept low wage in order to uh, get, uh, accept low wage. But of course, people say, particularly we talk about, actually, on the one hand, from macroeconomic issue, this is a problem. But from business perspective, actually, the keeps wage, the, a lot of people put pressure, they're actually, the downward pressure on the wage. Okay? That's, we we can, can, can see which, which way we look at the problem. Okay? Of course, one of the big challenges uh, towards the Chinese economy, further development of this uh, of this uh, e economy is the banking and financial systems. Up to now, uh, China's banking system is still dominated by four largest state-owned banks. Okay? And the Bank, bank of China, uh, bank, uh, Construction Bank of China, Agricultural Bank of China, uh, 
Bank of Industrial and Commerce, Chinese Bank of Industrial Commerce. Okay, and this still took a majority of the deposit loan. The savings are channeled through these banks, sometimes, actually, most of the times, to inefficient state-owned enterprises. But that will change. That will change, because this year, 2005, is the last year. Uh, that's called the Great Period, because in 2006, China must fulfill its obligations of opening those service sectors, including banking, insurance, uh, commerce, and trade, and sectors. Okay, and of course, China's WTO commitment open largely towards services. Because as you see up to now, the many of the manufacturing industry, the man multinationals, they also invested in China for ma in the manufacturing sector. But services, financial banking and other things, uh, telecommunication is still not yet as open as the manufacturing sector. But this will be open to multinational uh, Citibank, HSBC, other things. They will have full bank licenses one year from now. Okay. All those, people, those banks are parked now in Hong Kong, trying to re get ready to move into China. They hire people. And, okay. uh, the last issue is the political development. China now still the largest communist country in the world. Okay. But that is changing. Not in name. Not in name. Two years ago, actually, in the People's Republic of China now is, have about uh, 50 years in the Chinese constitution. The public properties were protected, not the private ones. Two years ago, uh, the People's Congress of China amended the constitution for the first time stated private properties are also protected. And there, there reflect changes. Okay. And you see here, the situation here, you see uh, for the Communist Party now, the big drive for the party membership is to recruit entrepreneurs, intellectuals, and if you are billionaires, please join the Communist Party. <laughs> so what we're talking about, the, the Communist Party itself, Turn to be a social elite group. Okay, it's a little bit like a social democratization of parties. Of course, name will not see that in foreseeable future the party's name will change, will be changed. But you see, actually, as we see here, regardless of the, the color of the cat, right, whether it's black and white, as long as a cat, cat the mouse, that a good cat. So, as politically, now there are a lot of the changes. Actually, that allow the, essentially the the authorities uh, make the system such flexible to allow the further economic growth. Okay, that is uh, the the issue. Okay, um, it's uh, very difficult uh, in a short period of time and to talk at the China uh, as uh, it's a big topic, right? Uh, hopefully, in this uh, 40 minutes, I'm uh, trying to convey a message, because China is in the, in the process, now still is in the process of economic tra and, and political transition. Okay. China has achieved a significant progress on the way to establish a market economy. Okay. And the enormous challenges. And also a lot of opportunities for Chinese entrepreneurs, for Chinese people, as well as for multinationals and the companies in the U.S., large and small, to explore these opportunities. Thank you.